Sister Sapp. You have your alarm set? Soraka, how you doing, lady? Happy Friday, Sister Sapp. Um, Sister Sapp, do you have your alarm set? Johnny Brooks, y'all got y'all's alarm set. Y'all y'all are in right away. Amen. Amen. Well, we are in here for Mark chapter 1, verse 12 through 28. We'll wait on some folk to come on in. Here they come. Here they come. Richard Stevenson, how you doing? My brother, how you doing? Sister Lynn, good afternoon, ma'am. Kim Steele, how you doing, lady? Sister Miller's in here, amen. Mark chapter 1, 12 through 28. Oh, amen. I understand. I understand. All right, we all invite some people in and Marion Foley. Uh, Y'all invite some people in and share so that people can join us. We're traveling through Mark chapter 1. Uh, Sister Carol, how you doing? Sister Keisha, how you doing? Brother Richard, all right. So we are, uh, we've been uh, passionately going through the book of Proverbs. And so we finished that on the 31st. And now we're going to be in the gospel of Mark. As I mentioned, we're not going to be doing whole chapters. We're going to be doing segments uh, of chapters so that the narrative doesn't change too greatly. So you'll see the narrative change today about three times. And so uh, we're going to get after Ray Sean. What's up, man? What's up, man? Good to see you. Sister Wilson, good to see you. Well, I'm going to pray for us and we're going to get going. So whoever else jumps in, they just jump in. Uh, Father God, we uh, come to you right now in the name of Jesus. Looking forward to um, getting an opportunity together to gather together during the middle of the day. Lord, just to uh, spend some time um, hearing from you about your son, Jesus Christ, um, who we introduced yesterday through Mark chapter 1, 1 through 11. God, we pray that as we press forward today in Mark 1, 12 through 28, that there would be those who hear the word of God and we grow as a result of it. As we get a chance to see your son, not what everybody said about him, but what you said about him through the scriptures. So I ask that the Holy Spirit would give us the ability to hear it and understand it and apply, Father God, and even waken uh, men up, Father God, open up blind eyes and deaf ears so they might see your son properly, high and lifted up. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, family, Mark chapter 1, verse 12 through 28. Mark chapter 1, verse 12 through 28. It says, immediately the spirit impelled him to go into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beast and the angels were ministering to him. Now, after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And he was going along, uh, along by the Sea of Galilee and he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired servants and went away to follow him. Verse 21. They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and began to teach. They were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was a man in the synagogue, in their synagogue, with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. Throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed so that they debated among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Immediately the news about him spread everywhere into the surrounding districts of Galilee. 
All right. So, fam, for those of you who just joined in, hey, Fobbs, thank you for praying for me earlier, man. Uh, I appreciate the prayer. I got that. Uh, Mike D., got, glad to see you in here, man. Glad to see you in here. Uh, as we're going through the Gospel of Mark and we pick up now, um, one of the things that you can ch uh, put down in the chat that is one of Mark's favorite words throughout his Gospel is immediately. Put that in the chat, immediately. Why is the word immediately important? It's because the way Mark writes. So these things are important. Mark, um, if you were to say, if Mark were writing today, he would be a TikToker. What do you mean by TikTok? TikTok normally has very short, potent uh, statements, very uh, sharp, potent reels. They're very short, impactful, and they're gone. Matthew, uh, Mark, I mean, Matthew, Luke, and John, they tell big stories, long stories. So they're, they're the long storyteller. That's not Mark. Mark is the TikToker. He's the young guy who he writes, and when he writes, he writes immediately and quickly and quickly, and he goes from thought to thought. He did that because the Romans were a get-to-the-business get type people. So as he's writing this letter in a Roman Gentile world, he's writing it in short, snip, short snippets. So boom, I'm going to give it to you, and I'm going to get out. So when you see that word immediately, he's, he's moving, he's moving fast. And so as we go back to verse 12, it says, immediately the spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. This immediately is on the backdrop of Jesus being baptized, being baptized. So after Jesus is baptized, the next major event was that the Holy Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, if you've been, if you're a believer and you've been reading Matthew and Luke, you hear the story about Jesus being tested and Satan asking him three questions. Notice that the TikToker, Mark, does not do that. He just says this, immediately the spirit impelled him to go into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan, no questions, and he was with the wild beasts and the angels were ministering to him. Now, here's the thing. Um, when Jesus goes out into the wilderness for 40 days, we know that he has been tempted for 40 days and for 40 nights and he also fast and prays for 40 days and for 40 nights. But one of the big statements that Jesus made that's omitted here is that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes out of the mouth of the Father. And Satan tempted, the adversary tempted Jesus with food. He wanted to turn these rocks into bread. And that's when Jesus said, um, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of the Father. Now, I want you to think about something. Jesus is being tempted directly by Satan after having been approved by God, Holy Spirit, boom, comes and descends, and authorized by God to do the ministry. Um, Adam and Eve, they were tempted by food and they failed. Another individual, Jacob, older brother Esau, was tempted by food and he lost his birthright. He failed. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, 1 through 3, it talks about how God led the children of Israel out into the wilderness to feed them, to test them and to tempt them to see if they would you know, really believe his word. They failed. So what he's showing you is that everybody else has failed except Jesus. And when it came down to desiring a fleshly appetite, that Jesus chose a spiritual appetite, and that was dependence on God versus dependence on self. And so that when Jesus got tempted, he was able to win the temptation because he depended on God and did not de uh, depend on self. And so what God is showing you is that Jesus is greater than all those other representatives of him who failed. He's showing us that he passed the test against Satan that other people did not pass. So the spirit impels him to go out into the wilderness. Um, and then it talks about how uh, the angels were coming and ministering to him. As the angels are ministering to Jesus, uh, they're coming by to provide what you would call heavenly assistance. Just like the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, that we who are saved, we have angels that provide ministering assistance to those that are saved. But then it says this other word, that the wild beasts were out there with him. So not only was Satan uh, out there tempting him, but the wild beasts were out there. Now, the wilderness uh, versus plush land was always viewed as a demonic realm. It was viewed as a place of darkness. And so the, with the wild beasts were also associated with that darkness. So in essence, satanic type, um, uh, they would view them as animals 
uh, that could now devour and eat man and try to destroy man. Whereas remember back in Genesis chapter one, we were had you know subduing power over all the animals. We were, we were given it to us originally, but now animals uh, could attack man, just like David had to fight off the lion and the bear. But these animals cannot get Jesus because Jesus still has ruling power. The interesting thing about this is Jesus is 40 days and 40 nights having fasted. 40 days and 40 nights having fasted. And at the end of his fast and prayer time, it actually shows you because of his dependence on God, how strong he is. He gets out of his temptation in 40 days and 40 nights, having fasted and prayed and depended on God. Where the children of Israel, when they're led out into the wilderness, they're in their temptation 40 years. Here, here's, here's a nugget for you. That you will normally get out of your problem faster through fasting and praying versus grumbling and complaining. The children of Israel were known as grumblers and complainers. And when you're being tempted and or you're facing testing in life, the proper biblical response like Jesus is to fast and to pray and to depend on the food of the Father to feed you for what you need and not depend on yourself and or uh, depend on others by grumbling and complaining about what you're going through. And so that 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 opens up that that portion with Jesus's temptation and him, him overcoming temptation. Now, it was a temptation from Satan's perspective. He was tempting him to fail. But from God's perspective, notice it was the spirit that led Jesus out into the wilderness. So the same spirit that baptized him is the same one that allowed him to go into the world. Now, James chapter one tells us that God doesn't tempt anybody, but God tests us. So from God's perspective, he was testing. What is the testing about in the life of the believer? The testing in the life of the believer is about showing who you really are and what your character is about. So when we're tested in James chapter one, two through four, the Bible says that God is testing us to prove where we really are in the faith. So a test from God is to show where you are in the faith and to show who you really are. And so as Jesus is tested by God, think about this. He's at his physical weakest, having fasted 40 days and 40 nights, but he's stronger than the greatest principality against him. Now think about that. He's tested directly by Satan, and he's stronger than him, although he's at his physically weakest, having fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, no, no physical food, you know, that he's eating or drinking, but he's depending on God and he overcomes. Think about how strong we could be if we utilize the tools of fasting and prayer and the word of God when it comes down to temptation. So that's how Jesus is showing you that God is showing you. I want to show you how strong my son is. Now, Adam and Eve, they had food around them every day. Uh, Esau had run one race and now he's ready to eat. God's feeding the children of Israel manna from heaven and water every day. And yet they're failing the test. It lets us see the difference between the Savior and his method of handling the test versus how we often handle tests in our lives. And so uh, the nugget that we should take away is fasting and prayer, dependence on the word of God, in the moments of testing that God is really trying to reveal your character. But Satan at the exact same time can tempt you to lean on your flesh and or to lean into his solicitations and you and I end up failing a test. So that's, that's the way we get out of it. Uh, let's move to the next part, verse 14. Now, after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. <coughs> now, what Jesus does is Jesus comes preaching the gospel that the kingdom of God is at hand, which means that the king is present, that Jesus Christ is is announcing himself as king to the Jewish people at that time. But in order for the Jewish people to receive the messianic kingdom at that time, they've got to believe in the king and they've got to repent and turn from their own ways. And so there are two things where he says that Jesus is preaching the gospel of God, saying the kingdom, of, uh, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. In other words, turn from this way uh, to turn from the wicked way and cling on to the right way. Turn from the wicked way and cling on to the right way. What's actually happening is that he's saying, 
in order for this kingdom to come the way God has designed it, there are two things that man has to do. That man has to receive the kingdom by receiving the king. You have to accept that Jesus is the king, so you repent and turn believing that Jesus is the Messiah, that your ways are insufficient, and you believe in him and the gospel of God and the kingdom comes to you. And so um, it's, an, it's an era of reign that the king ushers in uh, as a new administration. And so um, Jesus comes preaching that. Verse 16, he was going along by the Sea of Galilee. Now, in order for the king to be the king, the king has to have followers. He has to have an administrative staff. Notice this, Jesus' is administrative staff. He begins to call them. Um, it says, and as he was going along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Notice it lists their profession. Notice he's getting ready to call his disciples, and it lists their profession. What is their profession? Their profession is that they are fishermen. They provide the food for papados. Amen? Um, and Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, you won't be catching a live fish anymore and them dying by you catching them and bringing them to be consumed. What you're going to do is you're going to be catching dead men and making dead men alive. See, 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 he's going to twist their profession. Your, your new calling versus your career. In your career, you caught things that were alive, fish, and you made them dead. But I'm going to change your calling into where you catch dead men um, and you make them alive through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, the Bible says that we were dead in our, Ephesians 2, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, but he made us alive in Christ Jesus. So now as fishers of men, your purpose is going to be upgraded by Jesus. That we take men who are walking around biologically alive, but without believing the gospel and repenting of their ways, they cannot come into this living kingdom with this living Lord. Amen. And so he says, come and follow me. They're fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and they followed him. Now, notice this. It says they, they, that they left their nets. So they not only left their profession, but they left the source of their profits. Their profit source was the nets that catch the fish. You, the, the nets is what physically catches the fish and brings them in. So they left their profession. They leave their nets um, where they make their profits. And he says, going, on, uh, going a, little, uh, a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, uh, who were in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them and they left their father, Zebedee, uh, in the boat and the hired servants and went away to follow him. Now, they leave their father, Zebedee. So here are three things that have to happen when you're going to prioritize being a direct disciple of Jesus. Uh, in this case, he said, you're going to have to prioritize me above your profession. You're going to have to prioritize me above your profits. And you're going to have to prioritize me above your parents. In other words, nothing can be more important in your life than the prioritizing of Jesus. That him being the king is that he is greater than and more important than anything else in your life. This is the nugget. That the true disciple has to prioritize Jesus above their profession, above their prophets, and above their parents. Um, and the other thing I would say, above people. It says that they left their servants. They had hired servants that were that were depending on them. So when we're talking about being a disciple, now listen, the Bible doesn't teach that everybody has to leave their job. The Bible doesn't teach that because in Acts 18, you have Aquila and, and, and Priscilla who are who are uh, um, tent makers. You have Luke in the Gospel of Luke in the Book of Acts, who's a physician. You have Zenos, the lawyer, in the book of Titus. So there are people throughout the Bible that have jobs and also do ministry. But these gentlemen were called to a special, close, interpersonal discipleship relationship with Jesus Christ to ultimately go from disciples to apostles to preach the gospel to the world. They were called uniquely away from. But here's what every disciple has to do. Prioritize Jesus above your profession. Prioritize Jesus above your prophets, and prioritize Jesus above your parents and other people. So now, that's verse 20. So he calls them and they follow him. Now, uh, in your profession, um, and, you know, and with your prophets, you need to manage and steward those things well. So it's not just saying, oh, that doesn't mean anything, only Jesus does. 
it means maintain the character of Jesus in all that you do. Maintain the character of Jesus and the conduct of Jesus in all that you do. The conversations of Jesus in all that you do. That he's above that. He's prioritized above all those things. <clears throat> Verse 21. Now, notice that they're moving. He, why he's going to come to another scene. He's going to come to another TikTok. Here we go. They were into, uh, they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and he began to teach. And they were amazed at his teaching for he was teaching them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Just then, um, just then there was a man in, notice this, underline their synagogue. There was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit and he cried out. And he says, what business do we have with each other, Jesus uh, of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now, notice that Jesus comes to the synagogue. Um, and as Jesus comes to the synagogue, he begins to teach in the synagogue. And the people are blown away at his teaching. Well, if we were reading um, in Matthew chapter 5 of the Sermon on the Mount, which we'll be teaching on this year uh, on Tuesday nights uh, at, the, um, at, at Hunger and Thirst, um, it's going to say that Jesus is uh, teaching and the people are amazed at his teaching and he's not teaching like the scribes. Um, the scribes would repeat information. The scribes were uh, those that took notes. They were like the Xerox copying machines and they wrote things down. So they would take notes and read basically what other people said or other authorities said. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard it said, thou shalt not commit murder, but I say unto you. He then turns around and says, you have heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you. Now, um, you have heard it said, you know, uh, you know, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say unto you. So notice that Jesus was speaking from an authoritative perspective. Why? Because he doesn't need to quote anybody else because he is the ultimate quotation. He is God himself speaking live in the flesh. And so Jesus Christ is speaking with power. And the people notice the difference between Jesus's instruction and the instruction of others. The difference is that Jesus has the Holy Spirit leading him and guiding him in his instruction. In Luke chapter four, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, the, to bind up the brokenhearted, to preach re, uh, release to the, cavalry, uh, the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to preach the acceptable, favorable year of the Lord. So when Jesus is preaching, he's preaching under the authority of the Holy Spirit. He's not preaching just some common man message that he's trying to uh, get out. He's preaching the power of God through the person of God. And so that's why the people noticed the difference between what Jesus was saying as an authority and what they had been receiving from the scribes and the Pharisees. There's a difference. The power um, of the preaching and the person of the preaching came from the Holy Spirit. And this is not man giving an intellectual speech. Um, and that's what the scribes and the Pharisees were doing, including Nicodemus, because they, they had not been saved and or repented and turned to him. So... Notice this. Uh, so, 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 so then while he's in, the text says their synagogue. Here is a big, here's a big nugget. It says in verse 23, just then there was a man in their synagogue. You have to be careful when you say it's my church, my synagogue, because number one, we didn't die for it. Uh, number one, we didn't build it. Um, it was not our, uh, even the Old Testament, it wasn't their, their goal to build it. Um, it was God's goal to build a synagogue, a place to where you could be worshipped. But the problem is, is that we can take holy places and turn them into human motives. Um, you know, holy places where God is to be worshipped, the synagogue, and we can turn it into a place to where we have human missions and human motives behind it, to where it comes our place. This is how we do our thing here. Well, here's the deal. If the place was so powerful, this synagogue, how in the world is there a demon-possessed man who's sitting in that synagogue, and they never noticed him. They didn't notice the, 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 the power of darkness that was sitting right there among them because they too were embedded with that same darkness. But when the light of the world came in, then all of a sudden the demon was exposed. But the demon was hanging out in the church with them because they had no power, because the person of God and the power of God was not present. But when the presence of God comes, the demons got to move. And so as a result, the demon cries out. Jesus uh, cast the demon out. Why? Because the light of the world has come to expose the darkness of the day. 
And so it says, um, <clears throat> just then there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, what business do we have to do with, that, with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Uh, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Notice that demons know who Jesus is. Demons know who Jesus is because they've had encounters with him in the past. Um, they've had encounters with him ever since uh, what you would call eternity past. The de demons who were, who were once angels who sided with Lucifer and got kicked out of heaven, those demons, Second Peter chapter 2, uh, have been placed in the earth realm and also, uh, you know, under the earth realm. So these demonic forces know who Jesus is. So if the demons know who he is, then we ought to know who he is. The demon knows he's from Nazareth. The demon knows uh, where Jesus, you know, the, the demon is able to quote geography on the earth. And so demons know what's going on. Angelic beings know what's going on. Um, I won't get into Revelation real quick, but they uh, they talk about, hey, we know where you are. Jesus says this and wh the city that you're living in wh where Satan dwells and the place that you're in is a synagogue of Satan. It's a synagogue of Satan. So these are those things that were when man takes over running his his church, it might be a synagogue of the devil. It might be a place of the devil, and you not know it because it looks like a man's doing something holy. It looked like the scribes and the Pharisees were reading the Bible and telling everybody what they what they you know what they so called knew, but they didn't know him. So it's about knowing him. Um, but they they know who he is, and Jesus rebuked him, saying, "Be quiet and come out of him." Throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. Notice this, and then again they're all amazed. Now, in verse 27, they're amazed. And if you go back to verse 22, they're amazed. In verse 22, they were amazed at his teaching. But in verse 27, they were amazed uh, after he showed his power. So they debated among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. So this is not just some instruction, but this man has the authority to cast out demons. So in essence, they hadn't seen that before. That's not what the scribes were really doing. So people were under demonic influence. So when you start reading the gospel of Mark or the gospel of Matthew, the gospel of Luke, notice how many people are sick with disease. Notice how many people are demon possessed. Well, the Bible said in Deuteronomy chapter 28, if the people of God obeyed, that they would not be diseased. But because they were so disobedient as a people, that's why they have all these diseases. So Jesus is coming back with authority to cast those demonic forces out, to clean his people up so that they can think clearly and live clearly. Amen. <clears throat> and so he says, they were all amazed. So they debated among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. Immediately, the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding district of Galilee. So notice that news about Jesus spread because he's doing two things. He has um, powerful preaching and powerful performing. His ability to preach and perform. In other words, it is his words and his works that are impacting. It's not just words. Scribes, they got words. Um, however, Jesus has authoritative words and he has authoritative works that the demonic realm had to listen to him and obey. Uh, the sun comes up every single day because it obeys. The, the earth uh, spins around the sun every single day. Why? Because it obeys. But then God gives us the Holy Spirit inside of us so that we have the same ability to obey God and to walk with God and to live for God according to his will and according to his wisdom. But oftentimes it's us who still choose to walk in the flesh and to disobey. So ultimately, they recognize there's someone new here. And Jesus has said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I'm letting you know that the king is here. Therefore, you ought to repent and believe and as a result, enter into this kingdom. So when you see this level of authority take place and you maintain the same position, it's showing you that you've yet to repent and you've yet to believe. But if you have heard the stories of Jesus and you've witnessed the stories of Jesus, then you have to know that he's someone different. Now, we, I was talking this morning to someone about prayer. And I said, the reason why we know that Jesus is still alive, the reason why we can believe in the resurrection is because um, we serve a God who answers prayer. So if you read in the Bible 
and you see that people don't, they, they pray to their gods, right? Jonah on the boat, they pray to their gods. Do their gods answer? Their gods don't answer. But, but Jonah's God answers. In Elijah, 1 Kings 18, Elijah prays to his God. Guess who answers? Elijah's God. Did, did, did a Baal, the prophets of Baal's God answer? No. So you can pray, and although they could see Jesus, you and I have not seen Jesus, but we can pray, ask specific questions to him because we make our requests known, and he answers a specific question, although we don't see him. So here's a God in heaven, Father, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And because the Son goes to the Father, he says, ask whatever you wish according to my will, and I'll answer it. We know that we serve a living God. So if we've seen him do all these things and we've heard him do all these things, how can we still stay the same? That's why your testimony of the work of Christ is so important. It is the, by the blood of his, by the blood of the lamb and the power of his testimony that we overcome. Amen. <clears throat> so Mark chapter one, 12 through 28, we're done. Is there any questions, any favorite verses, any favorite sections? So we can look at them, but we are done on the dot, 1230 dawn holiday. We are out of here. <clears throat> so any any favorite parts? Amen. Lynn Daniels said, God does answer prayer. I'm a living testimony. Mm -hmm. Um, it says, how does, the question is that Sister Carol Gonzalez is asking is how do we understand that Jesus told the demon to be quiet and come out of him, but the demon throws him into convulsions um, and cried out with a loud voice? Good question. What Jesus told the demon to be quiet about was um, the recognition of who he was. So in verse 24, what business do we have with each other? Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now, when he says that, that's when Jesus tells him to be quiet because Jesus does not want the testimony of the demonic realm about him to try to say who he is. So he's telling him to be quiet about my identity because I'm going to tell the people who I am and my apostles or disciples are going to tell the people who I am and I want them to believe through the righteous witness not through the wicked witness. And so it's about them being quiet about identifying him. It's not only here, you'll see it in other passages in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where he's telling them to be quiet about saying who he is. He doesn't want the testimony of demons. He wants the testimony to come from, like Sister Lynn Daniel said, I'm an answer. Uh, uh, God has answered prayer. I, I, I'm a testimony. I'm a living testimony. He wants the testimony about who he is to come from his people, not from the demonic realm. So that's what he told, told him to be quiet about. You'll see it in other places. Verse 17, uh, and Jesus said, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Amen. Amazing verse because, you know, the, the thing is, it is the whole turn and transition of what you were emphasizing in your life. I'm going to switch around. If you look at the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9, and we'll get there through our Bible study, uh, Sister Thomas, um, you're going to see God turn Paul's whole original assignment around to what Paul was doing, to what Paul is now doing. It's literally a 180 reverse. Um, and so that's what he does. He turns, you know, our jobs around to where what we're doing is a 180 reverse. Amen. Verse 13. <clears throat> and he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts and the angels were ministering to him. Amen. <clears throat> nothing could overcome uh, Jesus. At his weakest, he's the strongest. And so, I, I mean, that's such amazing news. The devil um, is tempting us, but the reality is, is that um, even as we depend on God the same way he did, uh, we can receive victory. James says that in, in the book of James, um, submit to God, James chapter 4. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. In other words, put yourself under the cloak of God's authority. Submarine yourself, submerge yourself under his authority through the word of God, through the prayer to God, uh, through fasting. 
He says, that's what you do. That's how you submit yourself. And as a result, he says, resist the devil and the temptation or the solicitation, and he will flee from you. That ultimately he can't get to you because you're under the authority of God, the same way Christ was under the authority of God. So uh, praise God. That's, that, that's it. So any more, any more. Jesus above all. Brother Hodge, I see you in here. I pray that I will be immediately obedient to the Lord. Um, amen. Immediately obedient. Listen, um, all of us know that the Bible says that no man has been tempted uh, beyond what he can bear. Um, and God will not put on us more than we can bear. So here's the deal. Um, is the reason why knowing the word of God is important and dealing with the wisdom of God daily is so that when you and I are going through something, we have a scripture that the Holy Spirit will recall, the Holy Spirit will recall to us in the moment of temptation for, to, to help us to avoid uh, doing what the flesh would be appeal would would be appealing for the flesh to do. Amen. So, well, y'all, uh, that's good news. I think we'll be back tomorrow uh, around noon. And so, um, enjoyed being with you. Karen Romaine, fasting. How do I? Um, well, he, here's the thing about fasting. It's a great question. Um, is that fasting is the denial of self for the gaining of something greater. Fasting is denying an area of your life that you might gain something greater. So let's just say, for instance, you'll see people take an hour, day and age, a social media break, and they may break from social media for three months because that individual realizes through a relationship with the Holy Spirit that um, that person realizes through a relationship with the Holy Spirit that, man, I've been on social media too much. So I, take a, I, I took a break from social media and just scrolling and not doing stuff like this, you know, having Bible study, but, but just foolishness that we can all get caught up in just trying to look and see what's going on out there in the world. So, um, so you have to know what you need to fast from. What is distracting you from a more meaningful relationship with the Lord? Food is always good, always cool, no problem. Um, but at the exact same time, you may need to, or we may need to fast from talking on the phone. We may need to fast from uh, watching TV. You know, we just watched seven hours of TV and then had a two minute prayer and fell asleep in the prayer. So you got to know what it is that you're trying to remove from your life to gain something greater. And, and, and when you're fasting, it ought to be a sacrifice. It ought to be that, hey, I, I need to sacrifice this out of my life because I realize that what I'm feasting on is not good enough. See, fa fasting, which normally dealt with food, is what you're consuming is not good enough. You need something greater than what you're consuming. And that what you need greater is more of Jesus, more of the Holy Spirit, more of the word of God, the wisdom of God working in your life. So you fast. So it's just not the denial of this, but it's the gaining of this. But as you gain, replace the seven hours of TV with three hours of praying, you know, throughout the day. I'm not saying pray for three hours from one to four. I'm not saying that, but try to pray more, try to read your word more, meditate, go uh, ask somebody for forgiveness, uh, you know, re redefine a relationship that needs to be fixed, all those type of things. So how do we gain more? Amen. All right, family, man can't live by bread alone. Amen. So y'all, this is a good time. I hope that y'all enjoy Mark. I hope that we enjoy Mark and I hope that you invite other people in and feel free to share it. And um, you're welcome, Sister Lynn. I thank you. Uh, I came across someone and told them I will pray for the issue they responded. Why are you going to pray to God? Why are you going to pray to God? I already know what's going to happen. Um, well, when people think that prayer is our level of participation, um, have you ever heard like you, you were around a situation that everybody was praying about and you say, yeah, I'm gonna pray too. And you didn't pray. And then when the testimony came back and others, it was, oh, you know, I pray for that. I pray for that. That was that person participating with God and, 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 and they talked to God and God answered. So their joy is that God heard. 
you know, and that's the joy of getting closer and communing more with God because, man, I prayed for her to have that child. I prayed for them to get pregnant. I prayed for her father to get healed, and, and it happened. Well, the people that don't pray, they, don't, they, they can watch the victory, but it ain't the same. So, for instance, th this upcoming next two Sundays, let's just say you're rooting for Kansas City or you're rooting for San Francisco, and Kansas City wins, right? Kansas City's your team, so-called, and, and they win. Like, you're not from Kansas City, so you, it doesn't mean the same to you. It might mean something to you, but them people that live in Kansas City, it means everything to them. You know, you're a bandwagon fa fan because Patrick Mahomes jumped on the team, you know, so that type of stuff. You know, that, that, that ain't really your team. So uh, when you pray, you get to participate in the work of God. So that's what I tell the person. Hey, Amen. Mike D, did you say something? Hey, love you, man. Love you, Mike. Uh, I'll call you after this. Hey, uh, y'all, much love, family. Well, let's go ahead and, and sign off. Are you doing Noonday Nuggets on Saturday and Sunday in the month of February? Uh, do, you, do you want me to? Um, uh, if I'm going to be gone, I might be gone next week for a few days, but I will let you know. I'll let you know. Um, but if y'all are trying to say, Pastor, we don't mind if you take a break on Saturday and Sunday, you know, in February, I will. Um, uh, but, but, uh, you know, we, we, we family, this is what we do. So if y'all say, hey, Pastor, take a break, I'll take a break. And uh, if y'all say, Pastor, get some rest, I'll get some rest. Um, but, you know, I like, you know, being with y'all and I know that you all appreciate it, but I can take off, but there may be some days next week, <clears throat> I'll be in some meetings that'll, that'll probably, uh, interfere with this time. So Jovelle Hamilton. Hey man, Jovelle Hamilton. It was from my youth ministry back in the day. Jovelle just got a big time job. Uh, y'all shout out my man, Jovelle Hamilton. Jovelle, we just finished the Bible study, man, out of the gospel of Mark, but Jovelle was in my youth ministry and, uh, man, he, we had a good time. Um, and Jovelle got the big time job. I see you, man. Congratulations on the job. Praying for your mom, and I know that she's doing well. Uh, so she's telling a great story about her cancer story uh, online, man, and we're praying for her. So God, to God be the glory. All right? Sister, Sister Rockmore says, get your rest when you need it. Amen. Well, I'll let y'all know. I'll let y'all know uh, when I need it, and I, and, and I sure will. I, I appreciate y'all. And uh, look here. God bless y'all. We're out of here. Jovelle, we'll holler, man. Mike D, I'll holler at you. God bless. Yeah, we're tell, tell her we're praying for her, man. Tell her we're praying for her. All right, family. Love y'all much. Oh, did we pray? Did we pray? Let me pray. Father, thank you for the time together. Lord, may we continue to grow. Lord, and thank you for all that you're doing uh, with us and through us, God. May we continue to grow and consider each other. And uh, may I heed the, heed the call of those that said, Pastor, if you need some rest, get some rest. And uh, help me to do and listen and obey, uh, God, to what has been said by those that love and share in the ministry with us at Crossover. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. God bless y'all.